Hello and welcome back to another HAL Hack. My name is Cheyenne Meadows and I'm the High Ability Learning Specialist at the Nebraska Department of Education. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about independent learning contracts as a way to help your high ability learners. So why should we use independent learning contracts? So first of all, what a, what a contract is, is um, an agreement between the teacher and the student for what they're going to learn, how they're going to learn it, and how they will be evaluated. Just like any other contract, it's got stipulations and regulations in order to make sure that the student is hitting their targets, and they really engage students in the decision-making process. When looking at an independent learning contract option, it should most, uh, most frequently be paired with curriculum compacting. So for those of you who are not quite as familiar, curriculum compacting is when students show mastery of a unit or mastery of standards, instead of uh, continuing along the pace and uh, the scope and sequence with the class, the student will do uh, use that time for an extension or an enrichment opportunity. When, uh, when, when we compact the standards, we are pushing uh, everything down again compacting into a shorter time period to learn what is needed to learn in the unit and again that additional time can be used to extend or enrich. So in a study by Reese and Renzulli done in 2011 they saw that teachers eliminated 40 to 50 percent of the previously mastered curriculum and found that the test scores of those students uh, we're not any different than the ones who went through the whole curriculum. A lot of times we have this stigma that students who need to go through the entire scope and sequence and every single standard in order to score well on the test. But studies have shown that even if we take out the 50% uh, of standards they already know and allow them to do an extension activity, it doesn't change their test scores in a negative way. So what we want to do when we're compacting is we want to use an appropriately challenging project that goes in place of already mastered curriculum. We don't want to give them all of these assignments for the already mastered curriculum and then an additional assignment on top of that. It would be in place of the mastered curriculum. So for example, if the students in class are working on adding and subtracting and we know that our high ability learner has already mastered that, instead of the addition and subtraction worksheet, they would be allowed to work on their independent learning contract because they've already shown that they have mastered that standard. So how to use them is when we compact, we want to uh, pre-assess. So at the beginning of a unit or at the beginning of a set of standards, we want to pre-assess those students to display their mastery by giving them something that shows that they uh, have already learned what the class is going to be learning in the coming weeks. If the student shows mastery of most of the standards being covered, they can work on their independent study project instead of the classroom level curriculum. The students should participate in class when you are covering a standard they did not display mastery. So for example, if you are working on a novel unit and the student showed mastery of setting, plot, um, character, and all those different things, but they did not show mastery of theme, when you are teaching theme, they should participate in the regular class curriculum. And when you are covering things they have mastered, they should be able to work on their independent study project in order to extend and enrich what they already know. So when you're using an independent learning contract, it is really important that it is very clear with expectations and that's why it's a contract. We don't want to send students out there with a vague idea and uh, expect them to produce things and not get lost in the mud. So projects should be in interest and strength based as well. So while they should be tied to whatever subject you're working on, if you can hone in on a particular interest or strength of that student, they're going to get the most benefit out of that. Additionally, it should be inquiry based and have an authentic product. So for example, you can uh, in science, maybe uh, if you are learning about uh, geology and those students uh, are have already mastered that content, they can do an inquiry based project maybe about uh, the impact or the different kinds of uh, why or the different kinds of rocks in Nebraska where they are or something that related. Um, I'm not a science teacher, but um, something inquiry based and having that authentic product, which usually means some kind of a report or some kind of a product that they can share with not only their teacher, but share with other adults in the community or their class. And again, it's really important to be clear with the expectations and directions so the students know exactly what is expected of them when they are working on their project. This leads to specific outcomes. You want to make sure that there is some kind of a rubric or some kind of a, a mechanism uh, on which they're being evaluated and they are 
uh, very well aware of that and understand. So it can be an effort grade um, based on how hard they work on their project or academic risks. It can also just be a product grade in, uh, in place of the grade of whatever the project uh, the class is working on. You should have a clear assessment criteria. So whatever you're grading on, make sure it is very clear to the students and they know exactly what to do with their product. The expectations, both academic and behavioral, are very important. So not only are the academic expectations important, but you want to make sure that they know when they are working on their independent project, these are the behaviors you are expecting to see. Because most of the time it is independent, you want to make sure that they are very clear that they have to be working on their independent project, they need to be non-disruptive, they need to be doing X, Y, or Z in order to continue to be able to work on that project independently. Another important piece is frequent check-ins. We know that high ability learners can tend to go off on tangents or deep in a rabbit hole or those different kinds of things. You wanna make sure that they're staying on track and staying on time in order to finish their project when uh, it was projected to be done. And it should include student choice. We want the students to be invested in the project. And that's how, again, they're going to get the most learning out of that project is if they're interested and they're invested and they feel like it is worth doing. So we want to make sure that their choice and voice is in, involved. This is one example of a learning contract. And I've got links at the end of this uh, PowerPoint to share with you guys to uh, be able to access these examples. So this one would be an independent study in math. So as you can see, the teacher broke it down a couple different uh, into two different tasks. So the first one are tasks that they know are prerequisite learning and things that the student needs to know in order to complete the project. So those are the things that the student has to start with. They need to know all the definitions and understand really what is going on before they can go into their choice-based product. And then the second one, you can see they choose one of the following tasks. And from there, out of those tasks, they can choose which one is interesting to them. Um, there are several different modes um, also to show their learning. So if a student is more into a web page or maybe some students are more into writing, so that get, brings in that choice. So once they have that foundation as defined by the teacher of what they need to know, they then get to choose what they are interested in to apply that knowledge. This one is another example of a learning contract form, um, and it's something that you would give to the student and the student and teacher would create the contract together. So this is where the student would decide what they want to learn and how they're going to learn it, uh, when they think they can complete it, uh, what they think the product should be, um, how are you going to know what you learned, and uh, what kind of the grading should look like. So. The student would fill this out, the teacher may also fill this out, and then they would come together and they would come up with a contract that reflects what both of them uh, would like to see from this. Similarly, this is a little more guided one to complete a learning contract. It uh, kind of checks, has check boxes for what the student may want to do um, and why they think that would be a good demonstration, uh, what they might need help with, this is really great for a little bit older students because it makes them uh, think about an action plan. So they have to put their uh, project into steps and then as well as what they think they should be assessed on and when the date is completed. So the student would fill this out. They would go over it with the teacher and make tweaks until it is final. And then they would sign it and the teacher would sign it. And a lot of times these learning contracts also have a place for parents to sign as well so that everybody knows what the expectations are of the student and uh, what they are working on. So here's some really great resources. Um, I've pulled a couple of different places where there are really good examples of learning contracts and really great um, templates for learning contracts as well. So if you guys are interested in any of these, please visit these websites. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email me at cheyenne.meadows at nebraska.gov. Thank you for listening to another How Hack.